Thank you, musicians. Thank you, Scott, for that testimony. It's always an encouragement to hear of our God's mighty arm to save, is it not? Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 66. Isaiah chapter 66. It is a privilege and an honor to stand before you men this morning. And I wonder, before we read our text, um, as I look upon a, a chapel filled with seminarians, what, what motivates you to be here? What, what drives you to study? What are your ambitions? We obviously know that Paul tells us that we should make it our ambition to please the Lord. But, but practically speaking, and I, I think sometimes as ministers, as Christians, we aspire too much too little. I think we should be dreaming about how to reach the world for Christ. We ought to be strategizing how I can show this world that Yahweh is a great king who must be feared among the nations. We should want to have an impact. We should be praying, Lord, establish the work of my hands. Lord, make my life count for your kingdom in the little time that I have left. But of course, that only just begs the question, how? How do we do that? How can I offer the greatest sacrifice to my king? What is God looking for in a worshiper? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like King Saul and show up saying, I saved the best sheep and oxen to sacrifice to Yahweh only to hear, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, obedience. And again, this raises the question, how does desire how does God desire that we serve him? What does God want from me? We, we can have maybe a lot of different ideas, but only our creator has the right to tell his creation what is required of them. So that's the question that God is going to answer for us this morning in Isaiah chapter 66. What is God looking for in a worshiper? They are familiar words to us, Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. We're going to divide the text up into two questions, two questions that God will answer for us to help us align our ambition to his. First, he answers the question why he does not need us, and second, what he does desire from us. Let me read the text, and then I'll, I'll set the context for us a little bit. Isaiah 66, verse 1, thus says the Lord. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Father, what, what can we say to a God who is so high and lifted up, a God who is so holy and exalted, when we, like grasshoppers, scurry about your footstool? But our prayer and our earnest desire this morning is that your spirit would illumine our minds that we might understand this text and give us strength to obey it. We want to see the beauty of your perfections, Father. And we beg that your spirit would transform us into your image for your glory. Amen. The first question God answers to help us align our desires to his is why he does not need us, why God does not need us. I'll reread the first verse just to set it quickly in our hearts again. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? A house for me to rest? God says, you think I need a house? And there's, there's a lot of debate as to what God is talking about here what house he's referring to. And I'd like to just walk through a little bit of the context with you in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a really big book. You need to take Dr. Grisani's class. Uh, but just in a few minutes, uh, let's try to understand 
where we are here in Isaiah 66. Isaiah tells us in chapter 1, verse 1, that he ministered from the time of King Uzziah all the way to the time of King Hezekiah. We're talking around the 700 BC range. That means that Solomon's temple is still standing when Isaiah 66 is written. But that doesn't completely answer our question because, of course, most of Isaiah in its second portion is prophecy. A lot of it has to do with future events. So we kind of need to get a bird's eye view of what's going on. When Isaiah starts his book, starts his ministry, uh, the situation is dire. Uh, they've lost the stability of King Uzziah. The Assyrian army is ravaging the northern tribes, and everybody knows that Judah's next. Sennacherib and the Assyrian army conquer and then take captive the, the northern kingdom in 722 B.C., and so now they're marching south to conquer Judah. And the reality is, for anyone who's read their Old Testament, the reality is, is that Judah deserves to be exiled. Right? They are trusting in every God, every nation, everything other than Yahweh. And so God pronounces a curse on basically everything that Israel is trusting in. And then Isaiah describes their unrepentant sin graphically and why they needed to be disciplined as the covenant stipulated in Deuteronomy 28. But then in a somewhat unexpected turn, Hezekiah humbles himself and he prays. And the angel of the Lord comes and, and kills 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night and Sennacherib returns to Assyria. And at this moment, the, the book of Isaiah shifts a little bit in its emphasis from condemning Israel for her sin to the hope of future restoration through the Messiah. And the reason this is important for us is because as you understand more of the Old Testament, you'll understand that every time God talks about future restoration, he always talks about a future temple. So we can't understand Isaiah 66 as some do, that God was saying he no longer wanted a temple, that he's not concerned with the external sacrifice, and he's only interested in spiritual worship. That would be an erroneous importation of John 4 into Isaiah 66 in a very different context. We know Yahweh wants Israel to have a temple at this point. We know this because even after Solomon's temple is destroyed, Haggai condemns the people for not rebuilding it. And that's a hundred, couple hundred years after Isaiah 66. So God is not telling Israel, I don't want you to have a temple. What he's doing is he's correcting their false view of the temple. And especially as we dig into the immediate context of Isaiah 66, if we jump back just a few chapters to Isaiah chapter 63, Isaiah is prophesying about this future time, a future time where the temple has been destroyed by fire and the people are crying out. They're crying out, God, look upon us. Yahweh, look upon your people and see our affliction. Rend the heavens and come down and save as you once did. So in Isaiah 63, verse 15, the people say, Look down from heaven and see from your holy and beautiful habitation. Where are your zeal and your might? Israel's begging God to, to act. Fast forward a few chapters to Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. Again, the same verb. Behold, please look. We are your people. And why do they need God to look down favorably upon them? Isaiah 64, 11. Our holy and beautiful house where our fathers praised you has been burned by fire. And all our pleasant places have become ruins. Will you restrain yourselves at these things, O Lord? So Israel desperately wants God to look upon them. But they feel that they are far from his view. However, what Israel does not understand is that they're not receiving God's blessing, not because he's unfaithful to his covenant promises, but because they have been unfaithful. They have forsaken him. And God makes this crystal clear to him, them starting at the beginning of chapter 65. If the question is, why is it that God's eye of blessing was not upon Israel? The answer comes in verse 1. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am. Here I am to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. 
a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks. So God is prophesying about this future time when the temple has been burned, explaining why it is that his eye of blessing was not upon them. And it's because of their sin. And that's not just the immediate preceding context. It's also the immediate context that follows Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Jump back to Isaiah 66 and let's pick it up at verse 3. Where God says, He who slaughters an ox is like one who kills a man. He who sacrifices a lamb like one who breaks a dog's neck. He who presents a grain offering like one who offers pig's blood. He who makes a memorial offering of frankincense like one who blesses an idol. And the question is why? Why was God viewing their sacrifice in such a profane way? Is it that he no longer wanted them? The answer would be incorrect. We're in the old covenant. God demands that his people make these sacrifices to him. The issue is not that they're making them. The issue is how. Because the second half of Isaiah 66, 3 gives us the answer of why these things were an abomination to him. These have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. The temple is not the issue. The problem is how they are worshiping. Their faith was not in Yahweh and their heart was not in their worship. And because of the sinful way in which they were sacrificing, their worship had been corrupted. God compares their animal sacrifices to the murder of a man which he abhors. Right? They're offering up animals, but their hands and their hearts are so filthy and stained by sin that God, in a similar way that he does in, in Malachi 1, just is like screaming out, I wish someone would just shut the doors so they wouldn't offer up these disgusting sacrifices to my name. God wants them to sacrifice. God wants them to pray. But when their hearts are so full of unbelief, he hates their worship. And you're like, how can that be? This is Israel. They're God's chosen people. Okay, let's think about that. Israel is God's chosen people. That's correct. But not all Israel is Israel. Right? We understand that there's always a remnant, but most of, Israel, most of the Israelites in Israel's history were in fact unbelievers. And God was tired of their sinful worship and their faithless prayers. It's a modern example. It, it'd be like a bank robber, right? And he's standing in the lobby of the bank praying, Lord, God of my father Abraham, grant me success today as I rob this bank. And it's like, okay, prayer, I mean, prayer's a good thing. <laughs> but prayer without sin, right? If you're going to persevere in your sin, then God wants something more than prayer, more than sacrifice, and that's obedience. So pray, yes, sacrifice, yes, but without sin. Proverbs says, if one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is what? An abomination. He says earlier, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. And that's who the Israelites are at this point. They're wicked. So God says, if you're not going to stop sinning, look, I don't need your worship. I don't need a temple. And the Lord would say the same thing to us. You want to be a preacher? Good. Why? Because if you're after this for your own fame, if you've come to TMS so people will see you as spiritual and accomplished and you're after the prestige of what it means to be a master's man, God says, I do not need you. I do not need your sermons. Even if all of humanity were silent, the rocks would cry out my praise. I do not need you. And he gives two specific reasons in our context in Isaiah 66 as to why he doesn't need a temple. And it's going to help us align our desires with his. The first one, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. It's this majestically cosmic image of Yahweh inhabiting the entire universe as his throne. And he's resting his feet on our tiny little planet. Our God is in the heavens. He does what he pleases. And anyone who thinks they can go against him, well, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. So if Israel thought that they could offer something to Yahweh that he needed, 
They had a seriously flawed view of his grandeur. He needs nothing and no one. Right? You think Yahweh is going to rest in, in your little house? The imagery uh, reminds me of Genesis 11. You remember the entire human race rebelliously wants to make a name for themselves. And they want to build this tower that's going to reach up to God with its top in the heavens. And then Yahweh anthropomorphically steps off his throne and descends to see their little Lego tower that they're building. (laughs) that is supposedly reached up to his presence. God doesn't need to rest in their house. And and they should have understood this so clearly, right? I mean, it's Solomon when he dedicates the first temple who says, who is able to build him a house? Since heaven, even the highest heavens cannot contain him. Who am I to build him a house except it's a place to make offerings before him? Solomon understood the temple is not for Yahweh to rest. It's not for him. The temple is for us. It's a place where we can make sacrifices to him. The second reason God doesn't need us is found in verse 2. God says, all these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. You read some of the commentators and they're debating what it means, all these things. But just step into the imagery. From where is God speaking? Right? God is sitting in the heavens. God is inhabiting the entire universe. He's resting his feet on the earth and he says, all of this I made. All of this means everything. (laughs) Everything that exists, everything that has come into being, came into being through him. He's the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only eternal being in the universe. Everything else exists and depends upon him. Remember Paul said, the God who made the world and everything in it being Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So God's listening to Israel and he's asking them the question, you want to offer me something? What are you going to offer? It's already mine. Everything is mine. I made it all. Everything that exists came into its existence because of him, and everything that exists is being sustained by the word of his power. Israel's like the child who wants to buy his dad a Christmas present. But what does he need first? He needs to borrow some money from dad. And I think every father in here would affirm If that child is looking to buy a gift that will bring pleasure to his father, the money will gladly be given. But if that child, like Israel, wants the money so he can buy something to fulfill his own lusts and then gift it to his father, no father would be pleased with that. No father. So if we're going to align our desires with God's desires, we need to remember that it's all his Paul asks us the question, who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? So so why are we different? Why can one sing and, and why are you smart? Did you create your vocal cords? Did you make your brain? Do you sustain it? What do you have that you didn't receive? Sin, and and that's about it. Nothing else. So God tells us, you want to preach? If you want to preach because you want my name to be feared among the nations, because you love me and want to make my name great, then preach with all the strength that I endow. But if you want to preach... For your own selfish ambition, I do not need you. God does not need our sacrifices. He does not need our offering. It is all his. And even if the whole realm of nature were mine, 
Isaac Watts says, that were an offering far too small. His love demands my soul, my life, and my all. Well, God being a kind father isn't going to just rebuke Israel and then not tell them how to repent and what he's actually looking for. So after explaining why they had not caught his eye of blessing, why their worship was tainted because they did not understand his greatness and his holiness, his differentness, now he's going to tell them to whom he will look. You want my blessing, God says, align your ambition to this. Verse 2, this is what God does desire from us. This is the one to whom I will look. If you want to catch my eye, this is the man that I'm looking for. Obviously, this is more anthropomorphic language. God does not have eyes. He doesn't have to look one way or the other. He sees all. But, but God gazed throughout this scripture, speaks of his favor, looking favorably upon someone. In fact, in Psalm 80, it's used in synonymous parallelism with the verb to have regard for. This is what Israel has asked for. Israel has asked, Lord, look upon us and be gracious to us. Bless us. Save us. And so God responds, if you want to catch my eye of blessing, if you want me to notice you, here are the three characteristics that I'm looking for in a worshiper. Humble, contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. If you want to serve God in the way that he desires to be served, the first is that he's looking for the humble. Thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity and whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. Humility is, is such an emphasized quality in scripture, is it not? Humility having a, a correct assessment of yourself. Which is to say to not believe that you are more important than you actually are. And what are you? You are dust. Dust in which the great king has breathed his life that you might serve him. And the moment that you elevate yourself above that dust and believe that you should be served, you've fallen into the mother of all sins, which is pride. You are God's slave, created in his service. This is how the Bible continually defines humility. Paul says, Philippians 2, that humility is counting others as more important as ourselves, serving them, looking to serve their interests, not our own. And of course, we could talk all day about biblical definitions of humility, but really none of them compare to our Lord Jesus Christ. He, being Lord and God of very God, did not consider his equality with God something to be held on to, but he added humanity to his deity and came to earth, not making himself out to be the king of men, but making himself the slave of men, submitting himself to death by men, even death on a cross, the most highly exalted, to the most lowliest debasement. There is no way that you and I could even demonstrate such humility, we start from such a low point. There's no way we could humiliate ourselves, even close to what he has done. Christ, almighty God, came to earth and wrapping a towel around his waist, he washed our feet. And so sometimes I wonder in my own life, sometimes I look out at you men and I say, so you want to catch God's gaze. Why do I see no towel around your waist? Where is the service that demonstrates your desire to honor God in that way? God is not impressed by your grades. God is not impressed by your smooth homiletics or your clever leadership skills. Though these things like a temple are not evil in and of themselves, but these things as offerings lifted up to God are as repugnant as the slaughter of a man if they rise up to God from a proud heart. 
So even as believers, pride becomes the enemy of, of us all. Right? When you came to Christ, you enlisted in a war, a war to crucify self. And I think even more so as a preacher, because every week, whether you preached well or whether your people are just trying to be kind, you're going to be complimented. And if you don't actively and intentionally pour contempt on that pride, you will necessarily start to think too much of yourself. This applies to everyone. Seminary professors may God forbid that we would think that we are more important than our students because we have a few letters behind our name. God is not impressed by that. This is all our fight. This is all our war. A war against my greatest enemy, Josiah James Grauman. I think, again, as pastors, we're, we're so tempted in this area. As pastors, as husbands, as fathers, we've been delegated authority and influence. And our fallen world so desperately wants us to think that as we gain influence and authority, the more people we get to have serve us, the more people we get to tell what to do. But in Christ, we see that the more authority you have, the more influence you have, the greater responsibility to wash more feet you have. We are dust, gifted with the breath of life to serve. And yet, the strangest thing of all is that the moment, by God's grace and mercy, that you truly believe that you are but dust, the moment you stop striving for the praise of men, you'll catch the gaze of the high and exalted one. The last then will become first. If you want to be famous, I beg you, don't settle for the fame of this world that important people know you. Seek to be known by the only one that matters. That should be our ambition, to be humble, lowly in service to our creator. And he continues to, to hone in on this quality, adding a second characteristic, not just humble, but also contrite in spirit. Contrite is not a word that we use often in our modern vernacular. I started investigating a little bit in the dictionary what it, what it means. And the interesting thing, you know, often as we study the Bible, we, we try to see how a particular word is used throughout the scripture. This helps us kind of key into intertextual clues and, and what the author might be thinking. The word contrite here is not a common word. And interestingly, almost exclusively, it means crippled. It's used to describe Mephibosheth's crippled feet in 2 Samuel 4 and 9. And I think that very concrete, physical language helps us understand what God is getting after in the spiritual realm. That God is looking for those who are spiritually broken and crippled in spirit. God is looking for beggars sitting at the corner knowing that they have nothing to offer. No ability to get anywhere without hope. They are broken over their sin but why are they, they're broken because they know they're broken, <laughs> is the point. And, and it's an imagery that, that is illustrated in a lot of different ways in the Bible, isn't it? The, it's the poor in spirit that enter into the kingdom. It's the man who understands that he's spiritually bankrupt. Jesus picks up an infant and he says, you have to become like this infant to enter into the kingdom of God. And we're meant to wonder then and ask ourselves, how is an infant going to get anywhere? <laughs> The same way the crippled beggar, the paralytic beggar is going to get anywhere in the mighty arms of Jesus because that's the only way anyone is going to get anywhere. As Edwards affirmed, we contribute nothing to our salvation except the sin that made it necessary. No sacrifice we make, no offering we raise to God is acceptable until we believe that. The man who believes that his own offering makes himself acceptable to God might as well raise the rank stench of pig's blood to God's nostril, because that's how he views it. Do you think yourself better than your neighbor because you're here at the master seminary? You think, oh, well, my neighbor didn't have faith. I did. They're not running as hard as I am. God's gaze is far from that heart. God is looking for men who are spiritually broken over their sin so that they will cry out to Christ for help. The sacrifices of God are what? a broken spirit and a contrite heart you will not despise, O God. Like the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, 
a sinner. God's final desire to help us align our aspirations to his. He's looking for the one who trembles at his word. The prophets are just brilliant, aren't they, in creating these word pictures, evoking such strong images in our mind of one who trembles at God's word. And, and again, as I studied the passage, I, I couldn't help but thinking that, that many who interpret it run far too quickly in search of a spiritual application without thinking of just the very concrete language of trembling and shaking at God's word. And I couldn't help my mind running over to Exodus 19. Jump over with me. Exodus 19, you know this passage. God is making the old covenant with his people. It's right before the Ten Commandments. God is on Mount Sinai. We're going to pick it up in verse 16. Exodus 19, 16. Where Moses writes, On the morning of the third day there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called to Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. And we know how the, the narrative continues and God gives the Ten Commandments. And then the people in chapter 20, verse 18, respond in this way. Now, when the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Unbelieving Israel, for a, a nanosecond at least, they physically trembled at the sound of God's word and for that moment they obeyed. And I think that's the point. Trembling at God's word, what it means to, to shake at God's word is that it produces obedience. In fact, if we run back to Isaiah 66, the prophet, as he continues in the chapter, in verse 5, uses the same phrase to describe believers. He says in Isaiah 66, 5, Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. You who tremble at his word is, is kind of a shorthand there for God's remnant, those who fear him, those who believe in him, those who love him, and then thus those who obey his commandments. To tremble at his word is to do what he says. And there's just so many implications that rise out of this statement. right? Because I, I certainly can't tremble at God's word if I don't know what it is. This demands I read it, that I memorize it, that I meditate it upon it. This demands that I be precise in my exegesis. If I'm terrified to disobey it, I'm terrified to misinterpret it. This is what needs to drive our study. I, I must know Hebrew. I must know Greek because I fear God and I fear his word and I must do my very best to get it right. As a preacher, you cannot tremble before God's word and yet stand in front of his people and say, thus saith the Lord, if thus the Lord has not spoken. But again, I think the emphasis of the phrase in the context of Isaiah 66 must be seen as obedience. To tremble at his word is to obey the Bible. And you say, okay, Josiah, you had me there for a second, but that was kind of a leap. So to tremble at God's word is to obey the Bible. How did you get from, from word to Bible? Well, I think it's a connection that the author of Hebrews makes. If you can quickly jump over to Hebrews 12 with me. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going we're gonna to read a few verses here. Hebrews 12, 18, all the way through the end of the chapter. Because the Holy Spirit is making a connection here. A comparison between the way that God spoke at Sinai in Exodus 19 and the way that he speaks to us, new covenant believers, in his written word. And this is what it says, Hebrews 12, verse 18. For you have not come to what may be touched, 
a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice of whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, something greater, something bigger, something weightier, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Present participle. He is speaking to you right now as this word is being read. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised yet once more and I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of the things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So let me ask you this. If God rent open the roof of this chapel right now and the ground trembled as the sky peeled with thunder and you heard the deafening voice of God cry out, pray without ceasing, what would you do? I'll tell you what we'd all do. <laughs> Our faces would lie prostrate on the ground bodies quaking with fear as we all in unison with trembling lips would say, yes, Lord. God is looking for the man who will respond that way when he is spoken to in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. God is looking for the man who hears his word and trembles in obedience. The man who trembles at his word is the man who studies and obeys every word of God. As I seek to bring this precious text to its conclusion, my prayer is that as we, as we read this text, as we study these verses, we might be overwhelmed with a sense of our own unworthiness. I hope that after reading Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, that we would all come to the conclusion, I want so badly to be that man to whom God would look. I want so desperately to catch God's gaze. But if this is what it takes, perfect humility, contrition, and trembling in obedient fear to every word, I will never earn God's eye of blessing. Ever. Ever. If God only looks to the one who is humble, contrite in spirit, and trembles at his word, then there can be only one. One to whom God looks upon based on his own merits and his own works. There is only one that deserves the attention of God's eye of blessing. Only one who is humble. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he humble and mounted on a donkey. There is only one contrite in spirit, co-eternal and co-equal with his father, yet he made himself of no repute, becoming the slave of men. There is only one who earned God's gaze based only on his own reverent fear, Hebrews 5, 7. There's only one with whom God is well pleased. He, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has God's gaze. My question to you is this. Does he have yours? Do you look to Jesus, the one who fills heaven and earth with his majesty? Do you look to Jesus, whose aseity makes him lack for nothing? 
For from him and through him and to him are all things. Do you look to Jesus? The one in whose face shines the knowledge of the glory of all God's perfections. All God's grace, all God's justice, all God's mercy, all God's kindness, all his patience, all his wrath, all his love. May your ambition be to set your gaze upon the humility and contrition and holy reverence of Jesus Christ so that in turn by the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, his humility and his contrition and his reverence can be seen in you. God's not impressed with our temples or our sacrifices if they're not offered with these qualities. Humility, contrition, and reverence before the grandeur of our great God. These are the true marks of a man after our own master's heart. Father, what can we say but forgive us? We have sinned. We have exalted ourselves. We have sought the praise of men when we are dust. We have maintained a a low view of you in order to entertain the idea that we deserve some of your glory. And we pray that you would humble us, that you would break us, and that you would cause us to tremble at your word. For your glory we pray.